Honey, do, 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 sugar, sugar. Hello, welcome to Fellowship in Essential Oils. We're diving into a really interesting, I think it's an essential oil, or is it? Today we're talking about Honey Absolute. How are you, my honey, my sugar, Liz? Well, I'm in my Melissa element, I would say, wouldn't you? It, amongst all the honey, in sitting in front of my my honeycomb with all my bees, I've got all my bees. And uh, I'm quite it, quite looking forward to tell you some interesting things about honey mysteries. So I'm going to confess right here and now that my experience with Honey Absolute ranges for about two hours when my sample <laughs> actually arrived and I've had a bit of a smell. It smells delectable. It's very sweet and very warming. Um, but as for knowledge and experience of working with this, I'm not going to have much to contribute today, but I know that bees are your passion. Um, and so I'm sure you're going to carry us very nicely today. So my first question I wanted to ask is we talk about essential oils and things that are gifted to us from plants. So you wanted to do honey absolute. Would this count as an essential oil or an absolute normally? It is an absolute, not an essential oil. Um, so to to make it even, the question even more complicated but easier to understand, there are two kinds of absolutes that are really, really similar. And depending on who produces them, they kind of cross over. So there is a honey absolute, but there's also a beeswax absolute. absolute. And the two are different. But if somebody makes honey absolute from honeycomb with all the honey in, obviously there is waxes in it. Uh, and so the two are kind of interchangeable, but you can buy them separately, Honey Absolute and uh, Beeswax Absolute. And the definition of an essential oil, which is kind of loose because citruses don't apply, which I'll explain that in a minute, is that it would have been distilled. So an essential oil is like for rosemary and thyme. Steam is passed through it and steam carries the molecules across and the ones that are light enough end up in an essential oil and you have water underneath. You can also make an essential oil by hydro distillation, things like um, what vetiver, I think sandalwood maybe as well, are hydro distilled. So they're boiled um, it, because they're quite, um, well, they're hard, aren't they? So they're boiled to make them soft. And then again, we are the same thing. The steam comes off and then the essential oil sits on top of a water. The reason why I said there's exceptions to the rule is, of course, citruses are cold pressed. They they come from a they um, produced by a process called Equella pique, which is where they uh, they have like almost like loads and loads of pins that stab the surface of the um, the fruit and then it's squashed. But not all. Um, products will make an essential oil for very different reasons sometimes some things just don't have an essential oil because the active molecules are not oily so you might think of witch hazel for example always water never an essential oil because their active constituents are watery things like um roses um, there is an essential oil but there's also an absolute and this is how we get to absolute so things like um, jasmine, for example, roses, can't think of any more, gardenia, where the, um, the blossoms are really quite delicate. Then what they do is they make what's called a concrete by extracting with a solvent and then washing it with alcohol. Um, and so this is what's happened here. So they do it with the beeswax. They do it also with the, with the um, honey that they uh, make a concrete. And it may be hexane or it may... I, um, yeah, I think it is hexane that, that makes the concrete and then they wash it off with alcohol. And what's interesting about the honey absolute, I've got it on a piece of paper here. The honey absolute smells quite boozy. Now, mm. um, if you ferment uh, honey, you get mead and mead predates wine by many, many uh, centuries archaeologically. So we've always known about like the boozy effect of um of fermented honey but of course this has been washed with an alcohol and you can really smell it because that's what it smells like it smells like good mead rather than smelling like honey yeah yeah so i guess you know 
we can make absolutes out of things other than plants and, and honey and honeycomb is an example of that. It smells great. I, I would definitely agree that, yeah, I can smell the meat as well. But is there any physical therapeutic benefits to having this in our collection? Well, yeah, because – and it depends on how it's been extracted, whether it's just from the, the honey or whether it's from the beeswax and the honey, because if it's done from a honeycomb, then you also have the beeswax. But honey is one of the most important medicinal properties we have on the planet. And, and even as, like, even somebody who didn't love bees would still tell you the same thing. You know, it's such a healing, antimicrobial, antibiotic, antifungal uh, thing but also um it acts as a humectant so what that means is it actually um soaks soaks and retains uh, moisture so if you've got very dry skin or itchy skin or uh, any kind of skin that's reactive honey is fantastic for it but you know think about if you've got a, a sore throat how you might have honey and lemon so uh, right across the board honey has all of these fantastic properties but what's really interesting is if you look at the gcms report for well i'm going to say the one that i had because I, I don't know because i only do have one and i've only ever had one it's not an oil that i use very often um it was given to me my sister gave it to me i would never have probably bought it even to be honest but um the the gcms report shows it's got really interesting unusual compounds within it so for example uh well, the GCMS report only actually ac accounts for 65% of the constituents. In other words, there are so many other trace ones. That it's not They're so small that it's not worth picking up. So now if you think that that's 35% of the oil, that's an awful lot of trace elements. And its biggest um, constituent on this one is 18.5% uh, so palmic acid. Uh, or palmitic acid, I should say, and 8%, just over 8% oleic acid. Now, those are not constituents that you would ever find in an essential oil because their molecules are too big. You would find them in um, carrier oils. So that's interesting in itself, isn't it? So, for example, palmitic acid, palm oil, there's so many different reasons why not to use palm oil, most of all the orangutans, in my opinion, anything with red hair is worth saving. Um, the, but um, the, uh, we, we, it, there's lots of reasons to stay away from palm oil, but it's made up of 45% palmitic um, acid, twenty almost 20% in the honey absolute. So that's high, you wouldn't find that in any essential oil. Likewise, nearly 10% oleic acid. Again, you would find that in lots of carrier oils, but particular olive oil. But the, really, the only, the, I can't find any research into the absolute in its own right. But of course, there's so much into beeswax, there's so much into um, to honey. Skin healing is going to be the main const uh, thing. But if you read up on it, what it will often tell you is it's used quite a lot in the perfumery industry, used a lot in co um, cosmetic industry. And so, for example, if you were going to make soap and you wanted to make a, a goat's milk soap, um, because the... Um, because the um, the honey loses its properties in heat, you might consider using honey absolute. Although the same would apply if it for any kind of essential oils, they're spoiled in saponification. But if you wanted to keep the the scent, then you could use that. So mainly, it would be for skincare. Mm. So I guess proactively, I, I'm kind of sitting here. I've got my I've got my bottle now, and apart from smelling great, and I. I haven't checked how thick it is and whether it would go very well in the diffuser. Maybe, you know, occasionally mixing it with a bit of moisturiser would be great, but especially, like you said, if you've got any bacterial infections or microbial infections on the skin, then, then it would be good for that, especially. Yeah, I mean, the only reason that I really use it is when I've got a sore throat, I like to gargle it. with, um, So, so that it's really soothing on your throat. But whether you should do that or not, I mean, I mean, there's all sorts of arguments about things that have got solvent, uh, solvent extraction probably have some kind of solvent residue. But I'm not one of those people that treats my body like a temple. So I'm going to go for the 
for the um for the honey but yeah very good for the skin generally so if you've got something like um reactive skin eczema psoriasis any of those things it's a lovely different oil to choose and yeah, mm. yes, in answer to your question, yeah, not too thick to put in a um a diffuser. Quite expensive though. Um and um yeah, it's kind of like a, a golden colour, of course, because it's honey. Don't know if I can't get to them. There you go. Um and so and so those golden colours they tend not to be too thick, do they? They tend to be it's the mm. kinds of ones with a brownie colour that are thick. I guess apart from the skincare properties, honey has been such a honoured um, substance for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I know one Egyptian myth said that the first bees came from when the sun god Ra um, cried once and his tears became the first bees and they then went on to create the honey and that so it has this real connection to the sun. But I'm sure you have maybe one or two little things to tell us about the history of honey. Oh, so yeah, I should really have thought about it, shouldn't I? So uh, uh, there is a lovely um, trees in one of the tombs at the Temple of Osiris. So you see the information kind of click back in space. Yes, I remember where it is. <laughs> Temple of Osiris. And it has four parts. So three is a triptych. I thought it was maybe a, a quadritique or something, but four parts to it that show the different seasons. And in each part, what you see is the beekeepers. So they are tending honey in a slightly different way to how we do today. We tend to uh, have hives. They had pipes and the, the bees would live in pipes. So actually, you might now see um bee houses for solitary bees and they've got the tubes in like the bamboo canes for the bees to go into that's actually not that dissimilar to how beekeeping started but just in bigger tubes and you see the beekeeper actually blowing sacred smoke into them so obviously we smoke our bees because what happens is it makes them uh, eat all the honey and go down into the hive away so it makes them more it's a bit like eating Christmas dinner they're just too fed up to 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 have a go at you so if you tend in your hive and they start to, to act up a bit you give them a bit of smoke so you see them doing that and then you see them taking out the honey and actually putting it into the um like a, an amphora um, over the over the different four seasons, so it's actually a lesson in what happens, what's supposed to happen in the ancient Egypt at different times, and actually even today they do the same thing as they did before in that uh, beehives are actually taken along the the Nile um, to let the bees settle onto different seasonal plants. So the so the bees actually follow the plants down the river as the sun obviously comes up and diff and there's different seasonality on the um, plants, and it's been that way for five thousand years. Um, and if you look at an Egyptian recipe, um, so like if you, for example, read the works of Dr. Lisa Manish, she lays out lots and lots of old Egyptian recipes four medicines, four incense, which actually quite often were the same thing. Um, pretty much always they will have a honey base to them. And it is, of course, in ancient Greece, nectar, uh, the ambrosia nectar um, is the, the food of the gods. And that's not surprising in a country like Greece that had so many medicinal herbs, so therefore so many, so many bees. And the bees, of course, were... Um, also revered in so many different cults. And the priestesses of Demeter Kaur is obviously who I research. They're called Melissae. The priestesses of um, Aphrodite, some of the cults, they were called Melissae. Uh, priestesses of um, Artemis, who is the holder of the herbal knowledge, also called Melissinomoi or, or bees there. So there are Right across the board, bees are really, really important to the different cults. And not surprising, really, when you think about you, you watch them gathering 
what 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 are they gathering it's hard to even know unless you know what they are you know the things can be different colors so you will you often see it pick um like picturally depicting it as like yellow because so then that's obviously uh pollen but they collect pollen from all different plants and then they take it into the hive and then what they do is they actually pass it between them so almost like kisses between them so and then as it um blends with their saliva then it becomes honey so you can pick it one or two ways you can say well uh, a plant will not fertilize unless it's been kissed by a bee and the honey does not happen unless you have honey like bee kisses or you can say bees for uh, this uh, honey is bees vomit whichever way you want to look at it really but that that is the honey so um and we, so then what is honey what do they make it for because uh, that amazes me how many people don't know what they are. So uh, so it is the food for the bee. It is their food. And they they uh, store it and they store it in honeycombs. So actually a good representation. I had some real honeycomb outside. That all took, cleared up yesterday and chucked it away because it was looking so horrible and minging. But so what they do is they actually uh, make hexagons like that because it's a very um efficient shape but what's interesting is what they do is they actually make a circle and then they use wax glands on their uh, on their chest and then they dot on each side so that is then that makes the honeycomb the the hexagon shape and then they do two different sizes mm -hmm. so they do a much bigger one and a much smaller one a much smaller one is where the queen comes down and lays an egg that becomes a worker bee so that is a fertilized egg but the bigger hexagons the, the bee the queen bee can also parthen, parthenogenically reproduce so she she has virgin births and those are the male bees and they go into a bigger hole as well so we're very interesting that <clears throat> virgin births actually predate christianity by a long long way <laughs> because they've always been in the beehive um and so what they do then is they create uh different sort of libraries so they'll have like a pollen library so they'll be and interestingly they file their pollen so when you open it they'll have like a yellow this is a yellow uh cell this is a purple cell this is a white cell and we don't really understand why but they're very clear that they know which ones are for which so they obviously use them differently because they categorize them they have honey cells, um, and then what they do is they'll they'll make the honey, they'll fill the the, the cell, but then they'll leave it open for a, pe a period of days, then they'll cap it. Um, and so you don't want to take any honey out of a hive until it's capped because it can go rancid, because what's got happening is they're waiting for the water to evaporate out of it. Um, so then they, they cap it. And then, of course, as I say, they have this other set of cells, which is where the queen lays the babies, the little eggs that will turn into little nymphs. And then over time, they will grow wings and then hatch out. So within the um, actual remit of a hive, you have many different types of honeycomb, but the honey absolute would only be taken from capped honey cells. That's it. Um, so, so there isn't any pollen left in there except what has been processed and just that honey. Um, and so the honey mysteries are, have kind of two main as well, three main aspects to them, I guess. The first would be the one I left out, but the first would be the divine feminine. You know, this is a, 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 um, a hive <clears throat> at the height of its, um, fruition at around about this time of year really massive at this time of year they've grown from about 10,000 bees to about 60,000 bees and only about 500 of those are drones males the rest are all sisters all looked after by usually one queen sometimes there will be more um it's what's called supersedure which is slightly different but usually just the one um, bee and everything happens in the darkness of the hives so that is the divine feminine the next aspect is community and the way that things work extremely down. It is one of the most advanced and efficient 
communities and civilizations that we know about. So when uh, I talked about how they went from um, egg to nymph to bee, they hatch as a bee. Uh, sisters, were, so what we call we workers, we would call sisters. Sisters can birth themselves, but uh, drones need help because they haven't got the same mandible, so they can't chew their way out. So the sisters will birth themselves, and immediately, it's so lovely to watch. If you just like, if you if you're quiet enough, they'll let you watch it. So you'll see the bee get itself out, and then the the sisters will kind of hurry over with honey here, here, here. So immediately they're burst into honey. This beautiful uh, community. Then this new bee will go off and do her job. Now, every the bees of every different age, depending on how many days old they are, will have a different job. We don't really understand how they know what the job is, but the new bees. Their first job is to go and find dead bees within the hive. So they'll go, they're called mortuary bees. They'll go up and they'll clear out. So you have this beautiful like circle of idea of death and rebirth because they've cleared them out. And it's my favorite thing to see. They grasp them by what, by what would be their hand and they pull them up. So it looks like angels taking souls away. And so you have this idea of community because you have like nurse bees and water bees and forager bees and they all do their job. So this very good community and this civilization that works well. And that is kind of the reason why the ancient Greeks used them, because this was the idea of the city state, the polis, they called it. So everything that kind of is good for the polis is pro polis, which is what the bees used to in, uh, insulate the hive, propolis. So this, so we've got divine feminine, we've got um, community, and last thing, and probably the most like useful thing to understand about using this kind of oil is that it is joy, joy and gratitude and love and just noticing that around you magic is happening all of the time. And particularly that that belongs so obviously so they fall into different mysteries. So obviously the the community falls on um, with the agricultural community with Demeter. So the the honey mysteries that are to do with joy and to do with love and to do with beauty are to do with Aphrodite, obviously. But this idea, if you think about of all the ways that honey, but also beeswax and also royal jelly are used in the beauty industry you know right from like hydra uh, hyd hydrating i'm trying to say hyd hydrogenating hydrating the skin uh to soothing and but also think about how wax we use waxing you know so all of that falls under aphrodite as well so do you think from a holistic healing point of view when we consider that we have a you know a bit of a loneliness or um yeah, I'd say loneliness epi epidemic where a lot of people, although we're more connected through the internet, a lot of people feel lonely and are isolated and many people will go sometimes many days without even having human contact. Do you think this is a really great um, gift from Mother Nature and from the bees to allow people to kind of remember the joy of community and the joy of sisterhood and brotherhood? Um, I'm getting a feel it's a very solar plexus kind of oil. They're helping you to get out there and kind of celebrate the magic of life and get out there and contribute a little bit to the community as well. Absolutely right. I mean, so so probably going into controversial waters now, but, you know, we use this word priestess a lot now. Funnily enough, when I started this work, it was like a word that you just wouldn't hear. But the 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 consciousness of the priestess archetype has risen very fast. But what you'll see is a lot of people are talking about priestesshood, but then their meditations are about themselves, about increasing their own power. Now, that's kind of a modern day interpretation of priestess, but a priestess serves. That's her job. Mm -hmm. She serves a goddess. So service to Mother Earth, to, to the community. And like, in a way, a priestess isn't a priestess unless somebody else calls a priestess, because... It's like, it's like a, a priest is like that. That uh, it, it identifies because he has been an access point to God for somebody else. So those, so the the priestesshood of old 
was about helping people to actually engage with different aspects of life. So the hidden beauty in life, the sacredness of community of life, being able to access the community of the dead. No, so this is so yes, honey is about the honey mysteries, but they are but the actual bee mysteries is about being able to like kind of never take your eyes off. What's that bee doing? What is it doing? What what am I missing here? What's happening in his world? What what's she doing? What's she doing? And when you watch that, you can't help but notice, oh, how weird that plant's changed. You know, it, it looks different to what I did last week. That's so interesting. And you just, it moves your consciousness out of like what we say is 3D reality to A, the tiny, tiny, tiny stuff that's happening beneath your feet and around you, but also huge stuff that's happening in the planets because then you start thinking well okay so the b is artemis and artemis is the moon so suddenly you go whoa i'm in a big space now so yeah it kind of moves you out of your own head thinking about yourself out into well what what's happening in on a wider uh imagination now i promised that i wouldn't ask you too many tricky questions but i've got one that might stump you a little bit You've obviously been talking a lot about like the Greek and Roman goddesses and you've re referred to Demeter and Aphrodite and Artemis um, in, in kind of connecting them to the bee and to honey. Um, but the Egyptians, you know, I already said that um, it was said that Ra cried from tears and that's where the first bees that created the honey came from. You mentioned Osiris. I also know that honey is sacred to an Egyptian god, Min, who's a little lesser known, but he's quite a cool god because in statues, He's basically a god of um, fertility and has a rather large penis. Um, so he's he's a fun one. But obviously there seems to be a lot of honey connections with the Egyptians with the masculine energy. You've been referencing more the Greek and the Roman with the feminine energy. Is is that just the difference between the different areas and cultures? No. No, it's a it's a it's a complicated thing. And if you want me to go through it, I can. But the, it, it's not to do with necessarily the divine masculine and the divine feminine. It's to do with what those gods or goddesses did. Mm. So, for example, Osiris. So I said about how there was the temple of Osiris. That's where the, the, um, the, the frieze was. He had a personification called Osiris Apis. So... Uh, strangely, you would think apis means bee. No, it doesn't. It, it, the, the apis was a bull. Um, and so this part of Osiris was his ba. So his uh, immortal soul. So when we see the pharaohs doing their sort of um, their rituals to become a god. The personification was to become Osiris Apis because Osiris Apis was believed to leave, leave the pharaoh's body at midnight and to go out in his solar bark and to travel through the world of Amduat, which was the soul of the, de uh, the, the place of the dead, where it was said that the souls went buzzing around like bees and to waken the gods and then to to ensure that we they he wakened the sun god ra and so that the, the, the sun would rise again so the so osiris apis was worshipped as this divine bull and there was always one apis bull and I can't remember exactly what the markings were but there were specific markings like the preacher had to have like black ears and a crescent moon on these flanks and whatever it's in my in my book if people want to look at it um and the so he was worshipped in its own right the osiris uh, the um the apis bull so he would be bought out each uh year on special days and people would lays of flowers around him like candles for him they would worship him um and when he died then he was buried in a special mausoleum called the serapium so the in the serapium there's these ancient bulls and it is said that 
bees were born from the carcasses of dead bulls. Um, and interestingly, the, the the it kind of does cross over, even though you, it seems like they're different like archetypes, it does cross over into Greek mis- mythology. So the beekeeping god is called Aristeus in um in Greece. And Aristeus appears in a, a myth about Odysseus. Uh, and Odysseus, uh, sorry, Orpheus, about Orpheus. Orpheus chases his wife. Eurydice, who has been taken down into the underworld. Um, and to, to get there, he's told that he must uh, sacrifice bee, uh, bulls, and from those bulls will be born bees. So, sorry, I missed, I mixed up two myths there. So the, that's Aristeus loses his bees, and then he's told to be able to repopulate them then he should should bury bulls and they would re- repopulate them that way. So you have this idea of bees being the souls of the dead. And uh, ancient Greece also believes that, that um, Sophocles says the swarm of the dead comes. So we have this idea of, of it being, once they leave the world, they uh, they become bees. But also that the souls of the new lives come in through bees. And Osiris is the god of regeneration. So whilst it is it's the same myth, although it's taken out of the masculine and feminine, it's about so on one hand you've got the Persephone idea of going down into the underworld to get the um the souls. Osiris is brings them from Ra. Mm. So really what I guess any deity that's linked to either the life, death, rebirth cycle um, or that kind of abundance and prosperity um, and even beauty with Aphrodite, I guess, that that's kind of where the honey absolute would be sacred to. Nearly. It's more about eternal life. And if you think about the honey, that honey never decays. So like uh, they've had uh, uh, honey coming out of uh, Tutankhamun's tomb that's still perfect and still holds um you know particles of, of pollen and my favorite as well the le- little legs of little bees um so it's uh, and they've been preserved for eternity yeah wow amazing so when we look at the kind of spiritual aspects is there anything else that you would kind of use honey absolute for in that respect so i think that we have to consider sacred geometry in it so if you are trying to bring in the sacred geometry of a hexagon it's very clearly being involved very closely with a hexagon um and so hexagons about divine harmony and balance and symmetry but also the relationship between the material world and the spiritual world and you can see how that would play out a lot. That's Pythagorean uh, stuff. But interestingly, Pythagoras and his cult are believed to have worshipped the hexagon um, and the number six. So this idea of uh, useful, I would say, for people who are doing like quite. I'm going to take that out of uh, out of context into a, uh, saying it a different way. When people start doing spiritual work. And the door opens. It can be very much you sink under it and you lose all sense of reality. And it's very hard to kind of grasp what's It's also quite annoying that everybody else is carrying on doing the mundane and you're like, whoa, everything else is happening out there. Stop worrying about that. But if you let that go on for too long, you kind of turn into, let me heal you, let me heal you, let me lay your hands on you, and you lose and you forget to pay the bills and all of that stuff that does need to happen in this reality. So it's very good for kind of being a, a, of grounding you and getting you back into the here and now and reminding you to go and do the washing up. I know stuff's going on, but go and do the washing up and really bringing you back into this 3D plane. Hmm. So I mentioned before, I would say from our discussion today and just, you know, my, my two hours of work before we jumped on, um, that this would be a solar plexus um, tool. What would you say? 
I think it, it can be used in several different ways. So I'm going to say I agree to that. I'm going to come back to that solar plexus because I've got an interesting sort of detail about that. But usually things that belong to um, Aphrodite would sit at the heart chakra. Um, and I think this idea of love and gratitude and compassion and community, that stuff comes from the heart chakra. But likewise, anything to do with a spiritual quest is crown chakra as well, you know, this connection with the bigger things. So the the actual definition of the, like, the idea that goes behind the hexagon is the world soul that so is like the archetype that the, the the universe has its own sort of um life force the same as anything else has its own life force the bee has its own life force the plant has its own life force and of course uh, but actually the the actual graph uh, graphology of that is a hexagon so then connecting with the whole cosmos, then that has co obviously got to be a uh, crown chakra. Mm. Um, going back to what you said about the um, solar plexus, the solar plexus is Jupiter uh, medicine, and Jupiter is what's called the antidote to Saturn. So Saturn me medicine is cold. The first thing that you said was that it was warming, but also Saturn is dull and monotonous and disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. Remember how I said that it was about grounding everything that's like the Jupiter's about, whoa, let's look on beyond higher, higher learning, spiritual opening, expansion. Saturn brings it down. Um, and what's really interesting is recently they've discovered that that Saturn has a hexagon. So on the so imagine that there's like the the north pole of of Saturn like astrologically that's got to be the coldest of the coldest of the coldest places right mm. so there's actually magnetically anchored at the north pole of um, Jupiter a hexagonal vortex it's a it's a hurricane that's continually moving all of the time. So it goes around about 300 miles an hour, so about three times the worst kind of um, hurricane that we would have here on Earth, oddly. doesn't have an ocean underneath it. There's no water. And, of course, it is a gas giant. So the whole thing about um, the Saturn is it is a gas giant. So there's just like this vortex, for some reason, moving a hexagon that you can see very clearly, uh, on on satellites from space, which changes color, and over time it uh, it, cha uh, it changes. So we uh, so we have observed it over a period, I think, of nine years on a um, a satellite called Castini, and the last pictures that were taken of the um, the hexagonal um, the ha hexagon of Saturn. That's what it's called. They had it had turned to be honey colored. So I think that we have to say that there's an energy from there right now of kind of grounding all of this energy that's coming and all of this bee consciousness, because suddenly it's gone from like nobody knew the bee consciousness to everybody you speak to is like, tell me about the bees. You know, the bees are really talking to me, um, grounding it down, which is what um, Saturn does. And fascinating as well, because it, correct me if I'm wrong, but Jupiter or Zeus was raised by the Musa, was raised by the bees and was raised on honey as well. Yes, he was. So there's two there's two different myths, but they both come from the same kind of thing. It's just like different caves saying, no, it was us. It was us. But yeah, so Kronos, his father was so um, had had slaughtered his own father. And then being told by an oracle that he would also be slaughtered by his own son. And so he decided to stop that. So poor old <clears throat> Gaia was just pregnant all of the time. And um, sorry, Rhea, in this case, Rhea was pregnant all of the time. And he decided he would swallow all of his children. So, protect so when this new child was born, Rhea hid him. 
uh, and he t- she took him to the to the Dictian cave, where, as you quite rightly say, the daughters of Aristeos, the beekeeping god, uh, one was a, a Melissa, the other was a um, Al- Almathea, if I remember rightly, who was a goat god. But yeah, she, so he was fed on milk and honey. Mm. So astrologically, if you had to pick a astrological body to pair with honey, what would you go for? Well, so I would say Jupiter and Venus. I don't. I don't think. I think depending on how you're using it, whether it, it is for that sort of soul expansion, expansion, or whether you are using it for like the anchoring love and the beauty. Different, mm. you know, different relationships depending on which honey mystery you're following. Yeah. Could could you attribute it to the sun? I, I was leaning towards the sun personally myself. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So it's definitely. I mean, everything about. Uh, so, so without giving away too many Melissa s- secrets, everything about honey is about um, harnessing the sun, you know. Yeah. So, so sipping the sun at every possible opportunity, and then taking that sun back to the hive. So, yeah, that fortification, of course. Yeah. yeah. Now, a common question we've been as we've been diving into these rarer um, oils and absolutes over the, the last few weeks is, first of all. Does an, do you think this needs to be in an aromatherapist's toolkit? I don't think it needs to be in anybody's toolkits. And, um, except maybe a perfumer, I would have thought it's a really good sort of middle to base note for perfumes. But no, I think it's a luxury item. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I'd be interested to know from everyone who's watched or listened this episode, if you've got it, what you do with it, or is it just sitting there? Have we given you any new ideas on how you could use it? And if you haven't got it, have we tickled your interest? Do you want to get your hands on it and let us know? Um, because it's a really interesting one. And I must admit, when you told me honey, I was like, there's a honey absolute? I had no idea. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to start bringing it into my skincare routine and seeing what I noticed in that way. But also I really like that idea of helping to overcome this loneliness and help people to step back out like the bees and get back into their community and do what they need to do. Even if it's dragging dead people around like the bees do. Yeah, exactly. And I would say that if, if anybody was inquisitive as to know what a beehive smelt like, because the smell of the beehive is incredible. In some situations, it's Melissa when they're a bit stressed, but, but when they're calm and everything's just moving on ahead, it does smell exactly like that when you open the lid. So that's, that's really quite a magical thing. If you're a bit chicken to go near a beehive, which I get because they can be beasts, but if you do want to smell, that is that is it. It's a beautiful. Mm, amazing, amazing. Is there anything else at all that we have to share with people about Honey Absolute? I know that this is something you're very passionate about. Have we missed anything at all? I don't think so. I don't think there's anything in there that's – I mean, there's nothing written about maximum dilution or anything like that. The only thing that really jumps out on, me, on the GCMS that might worry about is benzo, uh, benzoate, but it's less than 1%. So, no, I would just say go for 3% and see if that's right for you. There's nothing there that's going to make me think it would irritate your skin or do anything for epilepsy or, or in any kind of situation, I'd say don't use it in the first 16 weeks of pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, I never thought I'd do an episode on honey, but hey, that's, that's <laughs> what we're doing. And we've, I must admit, we've got some interesting episodes lined up. We won't we won't give too many secrets away, but stay tuned. And we're getting to that point where we're like, we're getting to most of the essential oils, but we'd love to know in the comments, is there something we've missed? And you're like, guys, what about this one? And we'll definitely pop that on the list and make sure we tackle that as well. But apart from that, thank you very much for hanging out with us this week. We'll see you next week when we dive into another episode of Fellowship in Essential Oils. Until then, take care. Goodbye.